Well, well, this is it's about words to, to, to let you know how words are everywhere. Boy, let's see. Uh, let, let me sum this up. This is um, from my creative writing class, but the, uh, you know, it says we write with words, obviously, you know, and as writers, we, we write what's in our heads, you know, we always go to our heads, and that's great. That's where we see thoughts images, ideas, but what about the words outside of you? Uh, do we forget those as writers? And I think it's important to note that there are words around us, like in this classroom. Do you ever notice the words in your classroom? Let's see, it says pull gently, hold to lock in place. Well, it, language surrounds us everywhere. There's language here. Um, classrooms for the future, my, you know, you could probably find, uh, yeah, let's see, I won't ask Evelyn to, to get the waste paper basket, but, uh, you know, th there are words in this trash can, there are words underneath, um, don't worry, my hands aren't uh, hopefully dirty, I won't. Uh, my, my point is, as writers, we've got to look at words outside our heads, and that's what this is about, because you, you want to always be in tune to language. And as, as it says here, you know, um, you know uh, no matter how much we write, there are always words being written about us. And that's true. You know, there's someone writing words about us in, in our lives, in our classrooms, in, in the documents that we carry. And what we're going to do today is uh, try to, one, be aware of those words, but also reclaim them as writers. And so, as it says here, you know, um, you know, all these words, like we're going to look at our wallets. We're, we're going to go into our wallets. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then any green things you give me, any green pieces of paper. <laughs> no, only kidding. Okay. But within your wallet, there are uh, many documents, I mean, that say things about you. And what do they say? Have you looked at them? You know, um, what, what do they say about you? You know, they say a lot about you. What do you do with that language? You know, you just leave it in your wallet, but what about taking back that language, okay? Um, you know, if you were to write a portrait of yourself, you would go into your head, but what about writing a portrait of yourself from, from your words? Here's a number here, I don't know. I think, that, I think that's Art Koreska's number. It's the only one I know with the R and a K. But yeah, what, what about all those words, you know? And I think, um, you know, they, they say something. <clears throat> I don't want to give my bank numbers, notice. But all these words here, all these words. What the heck is this? More, you know, the back of cards, you know. Oh, so many things. <laughs> but they create a portrait of us. And, and that's a good way to approach writing is not to just go into your head, but to see what's outside your head. And that's what I had students do in my creative writing class. They um, looked at what was in their wallets and they came up with, um, they made some uh, situations where it's like, um, you know, they came across the wallet and from that they had to identify the person. Like who was, it was actually themselves. Like this student here did it from the perspective of, you know, he was a body. And the body is identified as Eric M. Krupa, age 25, date of birth 10, 15, 983. It seems he's lied about his height as he certainly doesn't appear six feet. Blue eyes, blonde hair, last known address, Windsor, Connecticut. Uh, this wasn't a robbery, of course, because his bundle of money uh, and credit cards is still in his pocket. Why would uh, this man put this crap in a wallet? Doesn't <clears throat> make sense to me. Uh, from the looks of it, he only shops, shops at Target. How many trips could he have possibly needed from to take in the span of one week? He must have had a child or an elderly relative because these receipts indicate large quantities of diapers, wipes, and oatmeal. <laughs> he must have had a caring wife. 
is this note was written with love and has obviously been in his, in his junk bundle sandwiched between these credit cards for long enough to make it worn and faded. Hopefully it wasn't from a mistress, but then again it would provide us with a suspect if the wife found his note. Hmm. <coughs> I'm looking a little uh, uh, more of this. Um, perhaps this gentleman was dieting. Um, uh, as his pant size says 34, but he has no belt. Okay, he's looking at, uh, you know, could the perp have redressed him in other clothes? It would appear he's a simple man of few credit cards, receipts, quarters, and chapstick brand name, though, which contradicts his clothing choice. <laughs> uh, let the record show this gentleman had a record of $54.07 when he was found, and God we trust has been scratched off of one bill. <laughs> I see a parking pass here as well, though it doesn't say where to, his place of work perhaps, or school. Uh, the last piece of evidence we need to gather here would be an identifiable list of names. His handwriting was quite poor, but perhaps it is a list of friends. There are no phone numbers. We have to look at a later time. So, you know, that was one way of um, uh, looking at yourself. We'll look at one more, and then we'll... Uh, actually have you uh, try it yourself um, like um, you know this this woman went into her purse you know and looked at all the different things inside her purse from her checks to her debit cards to my gosh Heinz ketchup <laughs> packet too people's bank receipts you know uh, let, let's see um, Target I guess Target's pretty popular Victoria's Secret Eros Patale, uh, food receipts, McDonald's, Taco Bell, Olive Garden, Penns, Capital Community College Welcome Center, miscellaneous napkins, Nissan Sentra key card. <clears throat> and then after all that, she, um, she, she says, uh, from this, my findings, I was able to gather support to make the following conclusions of the owner. So she's looking at herself from the third person and writing about herself from the third person just through her wallet. Uh, the person that owned the purse was a young female <clears throat> in her mid-twenties perhaps. From the Yukon references I draw that she was a student there as well as a student at Capital Community College from the CCC Penn Found. Assuming so, she must have lived in Connecticut since the two institutions are located there. There were many receipts in both areas of her purse, so she does shop quite often like any other woman. Mm -hmm. Aero <coughs> Spitale, J.C. Penny confirmed that she is young and perhaps had a hip, laid-back personality. <laughs> she was in touch with her womanly side, seeing that she shopped at Victoria's Secret. Hmm. I wonder if she found out Victoria's <laughs> Secret. It was funny and unusual to find the ketchup packets but I guess they match the fast food receipts that were collected. The young lady must wear corrective lenses, most likely contacts, since they are a trend in young folks. Though the purse is full of items, the checkbook seems to be somewhat organized, so she uh, did try to stay neat. So that was a student's conclusion of what she looked like through the contents of her wallet. And what I'd like to try now is with the time we have is to, to go in your wallet, pull out your wallet or purse, and, and from all the items, can you pick it, three things and, and just look at three things and say, you know, write what they say about you, what they might mean. You know, like as I look at my license here, um, <clears throat> I, I endorse nobody. Look at this, it says endorsement stuff. So I endorse nobody, I'm apolitical, I don't know. Um, it's got a heart, but there's nothing next to it. I wear corrective lenses. My uh, capital card says I'm faculty. <coughs> um, well, let's see what else. Ah, my union card, I like that. Uh, <coughs> you know, my union card. Um, so I'm entitled to benefits and health programs. Uh, No, we'll leave the charge card. <laughs> <Okay. coughs> What's that? First three things I find, random. Okay, you could take a bunch out, but um, 
Yeah, just try, try to see what, what do three things say about you. Like, like a mini portrait. And if you could just scribble down a few things, then we'll go around the room and uh, see who you are according to uh, what other people have written about you. Oh. One of your classmates who was more responsive. And let's see, I'll take off my junk and put up. Uh, Any of this, you could know. Are you looking for, a, for some writing and just observing what we have? Yeah, can, can you just do a scribble some writing? That would be great. You know, from these three documents, um, I've discovered that this is a person, uh, you know, um, is he a risk taker from this car? Because maybe you uh, have a free p membership to the skydiving club. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you never know what, you, what will you say about yourself taking out your wallet. I've come across some interesting things in uh, previous exercises, but it, it's confident I could close the door if you weren't. No. Maybe I'll try. Let me try. Let's see. Let's see there, let's.
Well, yeah, yeah, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Just to 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 get a sense of where we are, I'm gonna pause here and show you what I did with three cards. Okay, just um, with three cards, and I started with pictures. You know. Uh, Anything goes with, with, with whatever is in your wallet. A picture of my faculty card, my bank card, and you're not going to steal my bank number, right? Okay. And my driver's license. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anyways, those are my three cards. And this is what I did, you know, just um, as a way of uh, finding out. Who is a man pictured on these cards? And then, you know, if there was more time, I would look at the language. But um, actually, those are the only pictures of me. Ironically, I got to do something because all my pictures are, 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 are in some kind of piece of bureaucracy. Wow, what does that mean? Uh, I don't know. But um, they're not pictures that I, that I took in a more informal setting. So what I wrote was uh, from three cards with pictures of the owner. I am able to come up with more questions than conclusions on the owner's bank card. He has long, almost afro-like hair, and is referred to by his first name, Ken DiMaggio, which is interesting. You would think the bank would be the most formal, right? Um, let, let's see. On his driver's license, we are almost given his full name, Kenneth R. DiMaggio. His hair in this picture is shorter hardly anything on the sides, a little on top. In this picture, he is posed against the background of a rocky New England shore, a background that does not quite fit with the portrait. On the third card, he is referred to as Kenneth DiMaggio, and above his name is the word faculty, which seems to give him an identification that the other two cards do not. Also, in this picture, the portrait of the owner is beneath a large city block size building, which almost seems to be burying or imprisoning the portrait of Mr. DiMaggio, <laughs> who is fully smiling in this picture and liking his driver's license and bank card. Um, just an observation from uh, three cards, just looking at the pictures. But again, the, the point is, you know, to look at yourself, out, to get outside your head as a writer, and a good way to do that is to see just what, what other people are, have said about you through things that you carry. And who would like to share? Okay. I have it written down there, so we okay. can just make these observations. Sure. Um, her membership cards seem to be divided into three categories. She has four museum memberships. Wow all over New England, uh, one on Cape Cod, one in Manhattan, one in Hartford, and one in Boston. And she has two library cards, and one on Cape Cod as well, as well as one in Hartford. Plus she has a Barnes & Noble membership card, leading me to believe that she really likes art and also likes to read. Um, she goes by three names, which perhaps also shows a love of words. OK, great. Who else would like to read? OK, no one. Yeah. My three favorites. First, the Canton Village Sunoco Park. I love this station where everyone knows your name. Next, Giovanni's card with his phone number, actual proof, chosen and printed by his beloved son, Stefano. Giovanni, my friend, confidant, and hairdresser for 25 years. Last, my new license with my new hairstyle. I think I look younger than I did in 2003 when I last renewed my license. <laughs> I like that. Well, even if I don't look younger, anything is an improvement over the passport photo I took last year. Great. I mean, just look at the stories you could get from that, as well as the Cape Cod, the museum. It's like uh, each museum could be a story. Um, what, what a story you could create, you know, conversation between you and your hairdresser. I mean, it's a start. I think this is also an exercise that can generate ideas as well. Evelyn, let's. Two coupons folded behind the bill are from stop and shop checkout receipts. One is for organic soup and the other for coffee filters. Stop and shop's database has clearly marked this customer as a yuppie. <laughs> but one of the coupons expired two months ago. 
so stop and stop, stop and stop's judgment may not be reliable. The movie theater pass offers the 11th movie free after 10 holes are punched. Only three are punched with dates in 2007. Why does this person carry around these old offers of vanished opportunities? The presence of an AARP card suggests the most cliche of all <laughs> ah, I, I love that line about vanished opportunity. That's nice, the way it seemed to come after examining your card. That's really nice. And I, I just got a thought. It's like, you know, you're, you're saying they assume I'm a yuppie. Maybe I'm not. You know, it would be a neat thing to do. Let's say you were going to develop this into a short story. What would be kind of neat is to maybe put something in your wallet that no one would expect. You know, with a, maybe an NRA membership card. <laughs> you know, but, um, but that's, you know, creates a sense of mystery. Um, but, but you see how, again, you, it's good as writers. Why, I want you to get outside your head and see the words around you. And who else would like to share? Okay, Nancy, we'll go, we'll go to Kevin next. We'll get out there. And, oh, I'm, I'm next. Okay, well, let's hear from oh, no. you. Oh, okay. So let's change it up a little bit. Let, let's let's hear that. from a man, yeah. Uh, I couldn't get out of this, like, the, like, authority or someone finding it sort of mode when you gave us an example, so it's going to sound like that probably. So, so it's okay. It's, like, it's like Homeland Security. It's like Rush Limbaugh has a Homeland Security <laughs> finding my wallet. Um, <laughs> the hemp wallet suggests a tension toward environmental sustainability, as hemp is a durable, easily grown material. Perhaps the owner is a pot-smoking hippie who wears nothing but tie-dyed and Birkenstocks. This conclusion is supported by the presence of not one, but two movie-related cards, one for the popular chain Blockbuster Video and one for the independent nonprofit Cinema House Real Artways. The latter is known to host a variety of left-leaning pinko miscreants with a love of subtitles. <laughs> two other findings contradict the above. First, a triple-A card, probably a gift from this person's more responsible and conservative parents. <laughs> Second is a color swatch, red, red wine, which looks like it's been in this wallet for some time. The investigator's best guess uh, is that you'll find a deep red VW bus located somewhere on the premises. It should be easy, easy to spot with all of the bumper stickers, most notably the attempt to be humorous, World Peas. <laughs> I didn't get any part of that. That's great. And I, I like the way you looked at it from the tone of Homeland Security. I mean, um, how would they perceive what's in your wallet? You know, and that's the attitude that they would have. You've, you've, but what you've done is create a very plausible perspective. You know, again, how often do you see other people the way they look at you? And that's a valuable tool for a writer. Uh, Nancy, and then we'll get the other Nancy. Okay. All right. Um, I found a motor vehicle registration form here. Uh, it indicates that this car is 13 years old. Uh, this person must be frugal. Or perhaps she splurges in other ways. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. The registration is overdue. <laughs> it seems maybe she's not so good at keeping up with deadlines. Uh, then there's a metro card. Apparently, um, she likes to use the subway uh, in New York. Uh, does she like to travel fast? Uh, perhaps she enjoys the cultural world uh, of the city. Uh, maybe she has friends and relatives there. And then uh, there's a $2 bill and a $1 bill. Uh, the $2 bill suggests that maybe she's somewhat superstitious and uh, maybe hopeful. Um, the $1 bill is signed uh, Nana in a, a childish hand. Uh, maybe she's pretty sentimental or just a doting grandmother. <laughs> OK, great. I like that combination of the money, the $2 bill and the $1 bill, the dates, how they're expired. Great. Uh, the metro card, look at that. It's like here we are in Connecticut, and you've got this card that creates distance suddenly. It's how it shows a sense of travel. OK, Nancy. The I carry a small case attached to my car key and office key. And this case comes around with me, um, comes with me around the college where I work. It contains, among other things, my business card for identification in the event of emergency. Since women my age have been known to be at high risk for heart attacks. Some breath myths. I talk a lot. I talk to a lot of people during the day. 
and um, a Lancome Juicy Tube lip gloss. I actually had to read the tube to see what it was. It's ultra shiny, so my lips shine when I smile to my students. It also keeps my lips moist in this dry building. Carrying the small case is much more convenient than my large purse, which contains things that are hard to replace, like money, credit cards, and most importantly, my expensive makeup items. Great. This is like a mini uh, version of the purse. <laughs> and that's the first time you looked at the lip gloss there? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, um, you know, but I think this is uh, one of the things I want to emphasize is, you know, for, for those interested in writing, just um, do you notice the words? Uh, when I was teaching creative writing on ground, we used to take a field trip by the river, and I would ask the students, you know, where's the last uh, sense of a word that you've seen? And it would be like there'd, you'd see a label or a piece of torn newspaper, and then that would be it. You'd be in complete wilderness. Uh, no more words, but think about that. How often do you go where you, where you are in an environment where there are no more words? And in the meantime, you know, how often do you notice the words that are around you? And I think um, it's important that we do. Let's see, can we get one more? Okay. Um, I did a, like, amnesia thing. Okay. I wake up in a grimy bus station, the sign on the wall reads Deadwood, South Dakota. How I got here is a mystery, and the only thing I have on is clothing in my back and the brown leather wallet. It isn't until I go to buy a bottle of water from the vending machine that I realize I don't have any money, and also that I don't have a clue what my name is. Credit cards and licenses all read the same. Jeff Bartos, a foreign name to my ears. I guess I was a paramedic in Connecticut, but that license expired. The REI Visa card is well worn, yeah, indicating that I used to like the outdoors. And the rumbling in my stomach reminds me that in the midst of my personal identity crisis, I had forgotten the last time I eaten. The Dunkin' Donuts gift card hidden in the back bowl catches my eye, along with a symbolic orange and purple glow from down the street. Like a zombie, I walk slowly to the lights. The promise of donuts is waging my anxiety towards not knowing who I am. The balance on my Dunkin' Donuts card is 74 cents, and each of the three credit cards is handily rejected. I can afford a single glazed donut, which I eat well, consider well, wondering how the hell I got to Deadwood. <laughs> okay, that was excellent, excellent. Did you see just the creative approaches that you all use to like, you know, yours was Homeland Security, yours was Amnesia, you know, the museums, um, the, the doting grandmother. I mean, there's so many ways to, you know, once you look at this pile of foreign words to say, how can I, you know, create a situation where I look at this? I mean, the possible, there's so many ways to do it, and that was a, a wonderful way. Um, see, we would just, let's see, can I take any questions or comments from you? Because we, if we do wrap up soon, you know, at least I'd like to get some feedback or anything I can help you with. Yeah. This, this was very, very creative, uh, having to do with putting together a mystery story, which is, yeah, which is wonderful. Sure. I actually thought in the very beginning that you were going to ask people to write some kind of a found poem. I've done that. I've, I've done that in another poem. way. That's another version of this, but where you just take lines and try to, from, from simple lines, create a poem. That's another way to approach this. Mm -hmm. But I did it more as kind of a prose portrait. But sure, you could do it that way, too. Yes. Um, on the poster advertising this workshop, it said something about across the curriculum. Are you writing across the oh course? yeah. So I'm uh, trying to dream up ways in which I can use well, it. Well, all of my class. I would I would class. say um, I would say number one is, is there a way to emphasize to students that words are not just something in a textbook? You know, we're asking students to critically read. You know, okay, here's a text. You know, I, I chose a text. I want you to read it. And some students feel like, yeah, here in another situation where the teachers leading me to water. Maybe a way to to get them to respond is to say, well, but look at the words in your wallet or the words around you. Look how someone else has already written about you. Have you deciphered what they are? That's another sense of critical reading. Why don't you know, as, as, you know as before looking at the text, let's take up out your wallets and write about it. And what is that saying? And can you then transfer that kind of process to a story or text? So that might be a way, I think. Um, other? How could someone, in, in, other than in a writing or an English class, use this kind of technique? Say, I teach management uh, marketing classes, or someone might teach science or math. 
How could they? Uh, well, I, I would, um, you know, I, I would, I would say uh, the language. What, what type of language is being used to define this subject, and to try to? Uh, b break through it, break it apart to see um, who, who's framed it. Uh, maybe another way to look at it is when we look at a text, uh, whether it's a math text or a philosophy text or an art text, who wrote it? From what perspective are they coming from? And that's important to know. So if you're going to, let's say, looking at the business world, um, this particular type of business writing is saying it's coming from which perspective, which culture. How might that help us by knowing you know, who is the person he's, who's written about it? That's how I might begin to approach that. Yes? Well, to me, Ken, in math, uh, when I was teaching the IDS course a lot, the students had a lot of like, anxiety about math, right? And, and math and science oriented things. So, I mean, do you think that like writing about those fears of, of math or like, you know, trying to wrestle with their own identity in relation to math. Because I think that exploring some of the things like you're doing what we've did in this exercise causes us to think about ourselves. Imagine if the prompt was something about writing about how you feel about math. Sure. <laughs> your sure. best si situation in a math class, your worst situation in a math class. And why not even, you know, extend it to like write about your math book? You know what I mean? Just um, what's in that book? You know, what are the pictures? I mean, you know, uh, why do they put certain pictures in a math book? If there's such anxiety, why do they have pictures of dogs and sunsets? Maybe that's the wrong <laughs> picture. Or, no, but it's like, you know, the, the, we're requiring students to read these books. They're designed a certain way. Why not have them uh, look at the material? I mean, at least take more ownership over what it is they're going to be studying and tested on. So that might be. Okay. So that might be where this can have more value outside of an English course, where it certainly has application. But again, I'm going to keep going back to my original thing. Um, what, you know, there are all these other words, not just in our heads and not just in our diaries, but words are around us. And I think it's, we go, we just kind of walk without any awareness. And I, that, is that helpful? Let me ask other instructors, is that helpful to say to students, well, what, what is the language right now of our culture saying about business, about um, health, about nursing, about science. Um, um, let, let's see, would someone like to read one of theirs and, and we'll take more uh, questions. Okay. Um, has a Bank of America debit card, so he keeps some money at hand. Um, has an assortment of business cards, everything from New Heart employees to Capital Community College employees to Newberry Comics employees to photographers to poets and even the auto mechanics ID. Uh, has a CVS card, so he must be trying to save some sort of money when he can. Um, has a video rental card with a lot of holes punched in it, River the Night, he rents a lot of movies. Keeps, card for, keeps cards for the Blue Turtle, which has been closed for months now. <laughs> well, it doesn't keep him from memorabilia. This person is probably a recent graduate, university employee who likes to watch movies, play video games. So it may be immature, seeing as how he likes to stay in the college environment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> e excellent. See, I lost that. Great. Um, hold it. It's just a card there. One of my important cards. Yeah, I was thinking just in response to, um, you know, how, how do you apply, or is there a way to apply creativity? from the classes that are not traditionally associated with creativity. Can you apply creativity in a math class, in a science class? You know, um, and, and is this assignment, at least if not an assignment that could do that, but a way like what Kevin did to have students write about math anxiety. Um, but is that another way to, to see this? Um, how do you expand uh, other, bring in other creative exercises? Yes. Are about math. Um, I 
think um, if they, if some of the students who have a lot of discomfort with uh, math might also have difficulty with their grading. So they might not want to um, uh, read their writing out, uh, out loud, but they might be willing to discuss the idea. Okay. And, and one of the ways in which um, I could picture getting a class off to a good start, especially in a developmental class, for example, would be to ask, um, what has all, always puzzled you about math? Or what, um, um, what ideas or skills seem to escape you? Or what's easy for you in math? What's hard? What's your favorite, what was your favorite thing to do in math when you were in elementary school? Something that gets a dialogue going in the class. And then if that instructor is able and ready to, um, you know, work out some kind of creative um, part of the curriculum with which to deal with some of the fears and some of the skills and some of the students' interests and what they have been successful with in math and so forth. Um, I think that could be, could be helpful. Okay, great. Yes. I'm going to take uh, Nancy's very good word, uh, dialogue, and go someplace else for that. I was thinking that what matters, too, about taking all the individual cards out and then creating a story is showing that things have a context, mm -hmm. that they're not just separate items stashed in a wall or stashed in a pocketbook. I think what our students really have um, have a way to go thinking about items in a textbook or items in the well, brain or items in the universe as part of something else. As Kevin was saying, you know, everything has a larger context, a larger picture, depending upon who's looking. So to be able to talk about that, that they're okay. not just separate Yeah, stories, I mean, what, what's in your... Problems that yeah. have a bigger context that we can that we can work with and that we can work I mean, with. Again, what is in your wallet? They may be random things, but somehow they relate to you. Whether you put them there, whether it got put there, whether it got, even if it was accidentally put there, whatever is in your wallet, it, it relates to you. Whether you like some of the cards or not. Or maybe you moved on from some of the things. But again, this is like a this is almost like a narrative of you that um, is waiting to be discovered. And is that what we're, kind of doing an education, getting students to discover a narrative of, of who they are, as well as a subject, let's say. So <coughs> that might be another way to expand it, yeah. yeah I was, it, it just hit me that one of the things, um, I think Nancy was, I said you're looking for a way to facilitate the student's comfort level so that they could write this. And, and I, uh, along with that idea, I think that's the I yeah. saw a theme for these three. You know, there was something they had in okay. my life, so maybe in math that would work too, if you could say, okay, you know, uh, pick three, each of you, pick three aspects of math, three components of math that you think of right away, and then maybe you can write that. Maybe that would help. That really helps. Okay, well, uh, yeah, when I was doing this, I said, let me narrow it down to three. Uh, for the students in my creative writing class, they did the entire wall, but that was different. But yeah, three's a great. I'm glad that it lets you come away with something, yes. Uh, for your marketing class, I was just looking through, thinking about it, and all these have various brand names on them. Mm -hmm. So you can have them like write a profile themselves what their purchasing habits are, or whatever, based off the crap they can yeah. wall. Yeah. <laughs> well, they've got Dunkin' Donuts card, GNC yeah. card, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond card, <laughs> REI card, Borders card, Stop & Shop card, that's just like the first five I grabbed. So. Or a profile of contemporary American yeah. culture, if you're doing history. If that's, yeah. An exercise I do um, in whatever class I'm teaching and it's a way to get everyone to speak and, and introduce themselves. And while I get organized and we wait for people to find the room, et cetera, is I put a, a sentence on the board, for example, in marketing, as a successful marketer, I must, or as a 
successful manager, I must, and I let them finish it in, in whatever way they want. And then as we go around the room, I write um, their ideas on the board, and it's a way for, again, for them to introduce each other, and they, we start to introduce some of the concepts that we'll be covering during the semester. And it's also a creative writing exercise. Yeah, yeah, uh, yes. I was just thinking that with the cards and the math uh, group, um, you, you could ask the students to think about um, what uh, relationship there is between this card and numbers. Okay. You know, uh, be it um, money or some other uh, usage of numbers. Sure, I mean, all, all about, if you look at the cards in your wallet, there's numbers on probably most of them. W w in what context? Uh, again, the thing is to just, um, you know, what's inside you, your experience is important, but to also ob observe the world just as a composition teacher, creative writing teacher. Uh, so one of the tough things is to get beginning writing, so just observe, look with your eyes. You know, it's like, yes, reach inside your mind, but, you know, use your eyes and, of course, your ears, but observe the world around you. That's always a, a thing I'm pushing, and I, I think in ways that that can transfer to other classes as well, where, you know, um, you're observing the world around you. Um, well, uh, let's see, anyone find anything that they, they, they didn't expect to find in their wallet? Any? <laughs> yeah. It well, seems like it's supposed to, you know, obviously you probably use your wallet every day for something, at least once a day. Things end three, up four, uh, five times a day, right? You take it out, whatever. And yet, you, so you think that'd be a convenient place to put something that you use regularly, but I'm struck by, I, I never take those cards for like the check off 10, get one free thing, because I know I'll just lose it. And like I said, <laughs> two, two years old, something. The most recent one was two years old. I mean, but. So what a weird thing the wallet is anyway, because you use it regularly and that stuff can get to the Here, Here's like a scary thing. I mean, can you think of like a situation where you're denied any words to carry on you? I mean, what might that situation be? An airport after 9-11. An airport <laughs> after 9-11? Right. Like Arabic language on people's t-shirts that says, okay. I will not be silenced, but they couldn't read it, they couldn't translate it. So they assumed it was, remember that case? That, that person I did that not, case. I did not hear that, but is that what happens to people who are in prison or institutionalized? Do you like lose not just your, your rights, but also do you have any words on you? Like any cards, do you, do you lose all that stuff? Yeah, numbers. I mean, that'd be scary to just like um, not be allowed to own a simple card like this. You don't have that anymore. Um, well, uh, what do you think? You're going to all write a nice uh, continue from this, get some stories and uh, novels, at least, at least cure the math anxiety for half our <laughs> students? Uh. OK, any other questions? All right, well, all I think, yes. See, see, I, I, I with It's ironic, but students are are writing a lot, ironically, with inter, with internet, with email, with blogs. That's the irony. They're they're writing a lot just through the computers. Um, so it seems like they're writing, and if yet they're afraid of writing, yet they're already doing it. Is there a way to somehow tap into that? That's it's yes. another workshop. But the thing is, they are writing. 
you know, or they're, and sometimes in class when I'm teaching, they're texting, you know, but the point <laughs> is, they, they are writing, perhaps more so than when I was their age. I mean, I was writing because I wanted to, but it seems like more non-writers are, through this device here, are spitting out words. So how to harness that into something more substantial, that's another thing, but, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I have run into students who write very descriptively, almost poetically, but what they're writing would turn out to be a fragment in formal English. And it is very unnerving to tell them that it's beautiful, that it won't pass the test of 101. Okay, but at least it's some writing. There's a start, you know, that, um, that now find a way to shape it into something more rich, you know. Um, uh, for me, the enemy is, is not the enemy, but to have no writing, you know, uh, that's a good start, you know, to have some kind of words. I don't care if they're messy. So long as they're saying something, you know, that's great. I think you can get playful with that and ask them, yeah. you know, maybe suggest a crazy, uh, flamboyant way of putting it in a sentence and getting them laughing and then looking helping them look to see how they could flesh it out. To sure, sure, that, yeah. You know, or yeah, that they don't have to fear language, yeah. Just, just throw that out there for other folks, too. Um, in our uh, academic reading course, English 073, um, Hassan Babatunji, some of you know, is, teaches a, sec a section of that, and he recently told our learning community group that one of the things he has them do creatively in response to readings is write haikus. Oh, yeah, I've heard so it's a simple enough form that he can teach it in a you know half a class, and they you know even if it's a little off or whatever you know, syllable yeah. wise, or it doesn't really matter. But he's getting them to channel the, whatever they read into this little bit of creative writing, and he'll he'll do it throughout the semester. And at the end of the semester, they'll actually do some readings of this of mm. stuff public in front of their classmates, and so. It's a creative writing technique being used in an academic reading setting as a way for them to, you know, just react. Maybe, maybe they're summarizing. I don't know what they're doing, but either way, it's kind of a, a neat little creative outlet that I think applies to some of what we're talking about. Here. Well, again, it's like getting them to respond to words that aren't their own. In this case, it's a text, yeah. and the text is unfortunately it's scary because it's this official thing, you know, and they're going to get graded on it, you know. Um, and to somehow make that know it's an it's official, but it doesn't have to be scary is, is always a how do you do that, you know? Yeah, I think you're right very much to the barber's point too, is that in those non writing classes you have some of that freedom to let them write in these more playful or more creative or non standard ways. You know, if they want to write a series of phrases as a list and a response, it's not a composition class or whatever, that should be good, or it's just a sort of brainstorm thing or whatever. And so in some ways, I feel like the, the, the reading teachers and the math teachers and the science teachers and all the other substitutes besides the writing teachers have in some ways more flexibility. Yeah, this kind of stuff. yeah we, we, we've got that mandate. Uh, yeah, we have to make sure we get X number of percentage of students. The critical yeah. writing, yes. Well, I told the student there, I thought it was, well, I thought what she had written was very, it, it conveyed a lot more than if it was in a sentence. However, given the fact that it was an English composition course, I felt that. <laughs> well, but, you know. But keep, but keep the style of the first Yeah, but again, if it's a first draft, you can only improve upon this. That's another way to reinforce, you know. That's a good first draft and to work from there. I mean, to just let students know that the, what they read in a newspaper and it has gone through edi uh, copy editors and revisions, and, and then no one gets it right the first time, you know, so to reinforce that aspect. Well, uh, I thank you all. This is quite a turnout, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> I ho hope uh, you enjoyed it and um, spread, spread the language. Uh, okay, okay, thanks. <clears throat>